And talking of bonds, let's pay a little bit more attention to the covalent bond itself. So pick the member of each group with the indicated property. We've got longer bond, carbon, carbon, single bond, or a carbon, carbon, double bond. Well, as bond order goes down, so in other words, this is bond order of one, this is bond order of two, the atoms are less strongly attracted to each other because you've got less electrons in there holding them together. So therefore, the bond length is going to go up because the attraction is reduced as the bond order goes down. And so therefore, the longer one will always be the single of the double and double will be longer than a triple. Now we go for single, a stronger bond between single bonds and double bonds. Well, as the bond order goes up, the atoms are more strongly attracted to each other. You've got two electrons there. You've got four electrons there holding the nuclei together. So therefore, the bigger the bond order, the stronger the bond. Thus, a double bond will always be stronger than a single bond, and a triple bond will always be stronger than a double bond. And we go shorter bonds, CCL, CBR, these are both single bonds, so no bond order issue. But as the atomic size go down, the nuclei are closer to each other. Therefore, the bond length is going to go down as the atom size goes down. When we look at the periodic table, both CL and BR are halogens. CL is smaller than BR. Therefore, CL will have the shorter bond to carbon than bromine does. Strongest carbon-carbon bonds. Um, well, carbon-carbon single bond is the weakest. Carbon-carbon double bond next. Carbon-carbon triple bond, the strongest. So let's just draw our lower structures and see what happens there. So C3H8, got to have the three carbons bonded with each other. And then you look at how many spaces are left to give each carbon four bonds. And you find that there are just enough for eight hydrogen. So we got single bonds there. C2H2, where you put two carbons bonded to each other. Each one has a hydrogen. Now you're done with atoms. So you have to fill up with extra carbon-carbon bonds. So there's a triple bond here. So that looks pretty good. C4H8. There's actually four ways that you can draw this structure. You can draw it with double bonds. And there's actually a third one with a double bond but I wasn't going to get silly with it. Or you can draw it as this nice little ring. And of course, when we get into organic chemistry, we'll see all these different possible isomers, ways to predict what isomers you're going to have. These are structural isomers. They have the same formula, but different structures. OK, so double bonds there. C2H6, put two carbons bonding together. They each need three more bonds. 2 times 3 is 6. You have just enough hydrogens to fill out there. C2H4, you're obviously same as this one, but you're lacking two of the hydrogens, which means that the carbons must form a double bond with each other. So the one that has the strongest carbon-carbon bond is the triple bond there. Now we're into electronegativity, arguably the most important concept in chemistry. So if we look at our periodic table, electronegativity increases as you go from left to right and increases as you go up, ignoring the noble gases, though, because at least at these levels, we say they don't make bonds. And so therefore, they're not going to have an electronegativity um, because electronegativity is a measure of an atom's attraction for electrons in a shared covalent bond. So anyway, let's pop these five atoms onto the periodic table. And what we find is that chlorine is obviously the one that is furthest over to the right and the one that is highest there. So chlorine, no ambiguity about it, has the highest electronegativity. Only oxygen and fluorine, of course, have a higher electronegativity than chlorine. Which of these elements be the most active as a non-metal, given their electronegativity values? Well, the more electronegative an atom is, the more non-metallic it is. And so therefore, it's going to be Z there, which of course is fluorine. Um, electronegativity of about four on the commonly accepted scale. Which following bonds would the phosphorus atom be the slightly positive one? Well, the way it's going to be slightly positive is if it is less electronegative than the other atom. So electronegativity, of course, increases from left to right and up, and there is phosphorus. So let's find these other atoms. They're silicon. Now, phosphorus is more electronegative than silicon because it's to the right. So therefore, phosphorus would have more electron density, thus it would have slightly negative bit. It's sucking electron density away from the silicon. 
Arsenic is below phosphorus, so again, phosphorus is more electronegative, so therefore the phosphorus would be slightly negative here. Phosphorus nitrogen, well, of course, nitrogen is the fourth most electronegative atom. It's more electronegative than phosphorus because it's above phosphorus, so therefore, in this case, the nitrogen would be slightly negative, the phosphorus would be slightly positive. And now let's think about pH. Remember, H is a bit silly. Its electronegativity value would put it right between boron and carbon. OK, so there's hydrogen there, there's phosphorus there. Now, of course, hydrogen is above phosphorus. Phosphorus is more to the right. So it's hard to say what it will be. But I would expect if you sort of held a gun to my head, even though I know the answer, I would say the phosphorus teeny bit more um, electronegative than the hydrogen, although actually they're effectively the same electronegativity. But no way can you tell that from the periodic table. But there's absolutely no ambiguity about it that nitrogen is more electronegative than phosphorus. So the nitrogen will be the slightly negative one in this bond and the phosphorus slightly positive. And indeed, we get to this one and we see hydrogen 2.1, phosphorus 2.1. As we said, phosphorus, hydrogen, very, very close in electronegativity. But anyway, which of the following compounds contains the least polar bonds? Well, polarity comes about as a result of difference in electronegativity. So therefore, the least polar is going to be the one that has the smallest difference in electronegativity. So pH Difference in electronegativity is zero, so that looks pretty non-polar, but let's keep checking. Here's arsenic and chlorine, going to be 0.9, silicon and hydrogen, well, excuse me, silicon and hydrogen, 0.3, antimony, that's antimony and chlorine, 1.1, and H and S, 0 0.4. Thus, the pH bonds of the smallest difference in electronegativity are thus the least polar of those ones there. Which bond of the partial charges on the atoms correct? So we want the more electronegative to be slightly negative, the less electronegative to be slightly positive. Again, looking at our table here, silicon and oxygen. Oxygen, obviously, much more electronegative than silicon, so should be slightly negative. Oxygen, of course, second most electronegative atom. Chlorine and bromine. Well, chlorine is above bromine, so chlorine will be more electronegative, so chlorine should be slightly negative. Bromine slightly positive, and that's not, of course, what we got there. They're flipped around. Chlorine, of course, third most electronegative element. N and B, well, N is the fourth most electronegative. B is just mundane, boring, hardly, you know, in the middle rank of the electronegativities. Nitrogen, obviously, much more to the right than boron, so we would expect nitrogen to be slightly negative, boron slightly positive. These are flipped, so that's wrong. And then ClCl, well, chlorine has the same electronegativity as chlorine, so this would not be a polar bond at all, so we'll just cross that out. So the silicon oxygen is the one in which the partial charges are correct, the silicon slightly positive, the oxygen slightly negative. Which final statements about electronegativity is false? Non-metals usually have higher electronegativities than metals. Well, non-metals are to the right of the table. Metals are to the left of the table. So that is correct because electronegativity increases as you go from left to right. Electronegativities cannot be directly measured experimentally. Um, excuse me, can be directly measured experimentally. That's actually false. You can't do one experiment that will tell you an electronegativity essay. Um, video in the extension material that talks about how Pauline first of all determined electronegativities and that's pretty much how it's still done today. HCl, partial ionic character, then HI, because EN are Cl more than that of I. Well, that's Cl, I is down here, chlorine, third most electronegative atom. So that's true. And if that's true, it means the bond is more polar in the HCl, so it has a higher partial ionic character, which is the other way to say that. So that's true. And in general, an atom's electronegativity inversely related to its radius. Well, radius uh, increases as you go down, electronegativity decreases as you go down. So therefore, yes, they, you can say they are inversely related. One goes up, the other goes down within a set of related atoms. Again, looking at a set of bonds in order of increasing polarity, what you see is we've got silicon, disulfur, oxygen, phosphorus, and fluorine. So there's silicon there, 
there's phosphorus sulfur oxygen and fluorine and so of course the further away that an atom gets from silicon the more polar its bonds going to be so silicon's electronegativity a little bit less than phosphorus which is less than sulfur which is less than oxygen which is less than fluorine so therefore a silicon phosphorus bond will be the least polar going up up to where silicon fluorine is the most polar so therefore answer d matches that which of these statements is false among elements in the main group those with the largest radius have the smallest electronegativity we just talked about that a minute ago the size increases as you go down a group and the electronegativity decreases as you go down a group so therefore the largest radius smallest electronegativity so that looks good C2H4 molecule, we've already bonded, drawn that out. As your C2H4 carbon needs, each carbon needs one more bond. So the best way to do it is to double bond it. So we have no lone pairs and one, two, three, four, five, six bonding pairs. That looks true. Covalent bonds stabilized by electrostatic forces between the joined nuclei and their shared electron pairs. Absolutely, that's a good definition of a covalent bond. At least one of these is false. Let's leave that behind till we look at the last one. The enthalpy change associated with breaking a covalent bond is always positive. Totally. Um, if you put, want to break a bond, you're having to pull apart things that are attracted to each other. You have to put energy into that. So that's true. That's the one that is false is the one that claims that one is false because all the others is true.